Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our weekly Cyber Policy Center workshop. We are thrilled uh, today to have Talia Stroud, who is a professor of communication uh, and director of the Center for Media Engagement at uh, University of Texas at Austin. Um, and I'm trying to think when we first met, it was, I think, just as you had started out teaching uh, at, at Texas, uh, having worked with uh, Kathleen Hall Jamison at, at University of Pennsylvania, where I was a professor a long time ago. Uh, and so Talia has become sort of a leader in, the, in this field uh, and, and uh, done all kinds of work in studying social media and, um, and media in general. Today she's going to talk about cross-partisan interaction in online discussion groups. As uh, per usual, uh, she'll talk for half an hour or so, and then we'll open up to questions uh, here in the room. And then those of you who are joining us on, on Zoom, uh, put your questions into Q&A, and they will be emailed to me on my phone, and, and I can uh, ask them of her. So thank you, Polly Stroud. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Nate, and thanks to the Center for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about partisan interaction uh, within online groups and uh, delighted to share what we're working on and to hear your thoughts about it. So to get started, uh, I want to start with the normative assumption that's guiding this research. And the normative assumption is that cross-cutting exposure, so people who are Democrats hearing from Republicans or people who are Republicans hearing from Democrats, is a normative good. This you can trace back in its roots a long, long time ago, far farther back than I'm giving credit here on this slide. But the idea is that there's a public sphere, that when it exists, it's good because people are hearing from different people, that exposure to cross-cutting ideas helps people better understand the views of others and builds tolerance. This has been empirically shown by scholars such as Vincent Price and Diana Mutz. And so the, the vantage point that I'm coming from normatively is that there's something really desirable about cross-cutting exposure. Can you hear me okay? Is it loud enough? Okay, just let me know if you can. I can pump up the volume. Uh, but we also know that cross-cutting exposure doesn't always work out. So despite this idea that it's a good thing, we should encourage people to hear from others who don't share their views, there is also a research tradition indicating that this isn't always or necessarily a good thing. Uh, a prominent, more recent example is Chris Bale's work, uh, where he found that exposure to opposing political views on social media, where he had others follow a bot that was getting them to, uh, uh, that was sharing uh, counter-attitudinal counter views uh, can actually increase polarization. So not always a good thing. There is some suggestion, though, that perhaps cross-cutting exposure in non-political spaces may be a particularly rewarding place to look for this. And there is a number of research findings and theoretical work that supports this assertion. So uh, one of their earlier studies um, doing this sort of work was Magdalena Wojciechak and Diana Mutz. And what they were doing is looking where people encounter politics and then where is it that people encounter politics uh, from those that don't share their views. And what they found is that in discussion groups online where people are encountering politics in a space that's non-political, uh, that in that sort of a context, that's where people were encountering counter attitudinal, attitudinal views. So discussion group online, not about politics, Although they don't encounter politics frequently, it is a space where they encounter those views with which they disagree. So you can think about any sort of context that this might happen. Think about a group you're part of about a, a sports team that you like, or maybe a television program that you like. When you're in those sorts of groups, you end up in a group with people that have lots of different political views. So even though what unites you in that group happens to be your affinity for a particular sports team, it just so happens to attract people with different political views. Uh, we've done some work looking at what happens when people incidentally encounter, so it's called incidental exposure. You weren't intending to seek out politics, but you happen to encounter it anyway. And when that happens, people do tend to learn. So there's something about these incidental exposure moments that supports the idea that something good can come from it. And then theoretically, work on intergroup contact theory uh, offers, I think, some of the best support that we should, we should have bear in mind when we're thinking about where people have productive conversations with those with whom they disagree. And in uh, one part of this enormous theory, there's lots of different components of it, so boiling it down to two bullet points feels very wrong. But with that said, um, the idea is that uh, one benefit to having groups from opposite sides come into contact with each other is that if in the initial stages of contact, the salience of the group membership is diminished, this is a good thing. And then once the relationships are developed, then you introduce the salience of the 
the divide that's happening there. Uh, now, this doesn't work for every division, uh, but it does work in the realm of politics because you can have people come together, bond over their shared experience around sports or TV or whatever it might happen to be, and then introduce politics later. The idea is that that's kind of an ideal setting for groups to come together and to appreciate each other's differences rather than falling into divides. So empirical and theoretical reasons to anticipate that there's something really good about groups online in non-political settings for bringing people together. Uh, but unfortunately, cross-cutting exposure in non-political spaces doesn't always work out. Uh, there's been academic work, and here I'm referencing a fantastic New Yorker article about a site called Ravelry. And this was a knitting site. And uh, it was a place where people from all over, all sorts of different walks of life were coming together to discuss their passion for knitting. And around about 2016, 2017, um, something happened, uh, a certain election happened, and all of a sudden in Ravelry, people started posting patterns uh, for knitting designs that had clear partisan tinges to them. And all of a sudden, Ravelry falls apart. So this non-political space that seems like it would be one of these theoretical and empirical ideals uh, falls apart because politics then takes over. And you have groups that then start introducing, uh, well, let's have a conservative knitting site. Let's have a different one. So I think this should put some pause on our optimism about what happens in non-political spaces when politics comes up. And I think a big reason is just the current nature of the world. We're living in a polarized climate right now and that this may thwart any benefits of cross-cutting exposure in non-political spaces. And I'd summarize this work in a couple bullet points saying that uh, polarization has increased over time in the United States. It affects behaviors in non-political contexts, so that should also give us reason to have some pause in thinking about the promise of non-political spaces uh, for cross-cutting exposure. Uh, perceptions of polarization are also really on the rise, so people believe that others are very, very polarized, even more than they empirically seem to be. And it's connected to political talk. There's been some research suggesting that when polarization is really heightened, people, rather than engaging with the other side, just opt out altogether. They don't want to talk about politics at all. So for all of these reasons, we have to have pause, despite the theoretical and empirical promise. So the motivating question for the research that I'm going to talk about today is what are the effects of incidentally encountering political content in non-political online group contexts? So the study design is as follows. Um, we randomly assign people to different group contexts online. And in some, we introduce politics partway through, and then we examine how people respond. So at the outset of this study, uh, we had people in groups about parenting, and we had people in groups about politics. And then for a subset of the groups on parenting, in the second half of the study, we interjected a little bit of politics to find out what would happen in the group. Uh, we combed through a lot of past work to try to figure out how many groups, what's the sample size, what exactly do we need to have happen here. Uh, here's just a, a smattering of past work that's also done, uh, done research looking at groups. In general, from this past work, the groups varied per condition from seven groups to 20 groups. Group size varied from four to 10 people. Uh, in our study, we did it in two phases. We used the first phase to really figure out what sort of attrition are we gonna look at. Whenever you're doing a longitudinal study like this, you can anticipate that you're gonna lose some people. We wanted to understand that more. We wanted to calculate carefully the sample size, so we did this in two phases in order to take this into account. And what we end up with in the end is we end up with groups with right around six people uh, across the numerous conditions. So here's how things pan out. In the first phase, uh, we are recruiting, we start with 2,000 people to begin with, and in the second phase, around 12,000. And then we have an enormous uh, amount of criteria for who we're gonna allow in the study. So we cut anyone out who's not a parent because we wanna keep parents across all of the groups. We did this on Reddit. So anyone that wasn't a current and frequent Reddit user was also cut out of the study designed at this part. Uh, we asked people if they would be willing to participate in a study for a three week time period and that they would be willing to post a certain number of times. So anyone that indicated they weren't willing to do that, cut out at this point. So at the end of all of that, we have people who are invited to participate, and in total we have 984 people who are invited to participate across the two waves. 
At that point, we randomly assign them to the three conditions, which I'll refer to throughout this as the parent condition, the politics condition, and the parent politics condition. That third one is the one where it starts out as parents, and then halfway through, we interject a little bit of politics. Um, as anticipated, we do have attrition throughout this. I'll talk about that in just a second. In the post wave, we end up uh, with 323 people that have completed the study across those, which was exactly in line with what we anticipated based on our phase one trial. So between the phases, we just made a couple of changes. The first change we made is we increased the number of people to each assigned group from 14 to 20. Uh, we noticed that some people were having trouble remembering exactly what their Reddit name was as part of this because we invited them the opportunity to create their own Reddit name that was disconnected from their actual Reddit account. So we came up with a couple of additional ways for people to remember what that was throughout the study. So we did a couple of things to try to make sure that we lost fewer people. Um, in general, the group size was comparable in terms of phase one and phase two, so we actually combined these two phases for the remainder of our analysis. And we didn't make any other substantive changes, so no changes to the experience or the text or the timeline or anything like that. Uh, study timeline. Uh, we recruited um, in July and October. Group discussions began uh, shortly thereafter, so we tried to get it as close as possible after we recruit them that they were entered into a subreddit to begin these conversations. Uh, we then introduced politics, as you see here, um, after a little bit of time that they were in the groups discussing. Group discussion ends, and then we have the post-wave measurement afterward. So hopefully you get the study design pretty clearly, yeah? Okay. So the, the conditions were signaled to the participants in a few ways. The first was the rules of the subreddit that were posted there indicated that this was either about parenting or that this was about politics. Uh, we had a moderator that only spoke once in these whole groups, and this was, you know, people knew they were part of a study, that they were participating in this, and the moderator just said uh, at the very beginning, welcome, I'm the moderator, I won't be participating, please introduce yourself and let other people know what's happening. And then the critical part of this study is that we included two confederates in every single group throughout the study. And these confederates were the ones that dictated the change from parenting to politics in the parenting politics group. Uh, so the Confederates introduced themselves in the subreddits and posted the discussion prompts suitable to each condition, so parenting only in the parenting group, for example. And then the Confederate scripts, the way that we designed these, is by a qualitative review of what was actually happening in subreddits at the time. Uh, now, this, there's a strength and a weakness to this. The strength to this is that it's a controlled situation. We've replicated across many groups. There is a weakness here, must be upfront about that, that the findings could be an artifact of the particular stimuli and the particular text that the Confederates were using. Uh, more to say on that a bit later, but we think that the strength here in terms of really determining what the effects are of exposure to politics outweighs any weaknesses um, here, but more to say about that. Okay, so here are example Confederate posts from the parenting group and the politics group in the subreddits. Um, both of these posts were featured in the mixed group. And so you see here, it would be things like, my 17-year-old asked for a hug today and then spent a whole five minutes actually talking to me. And, you know, you got a good exchange of people chatting about that. And then an uh, example of one for the... Um, it was in both the politics group and the parenting politics group is a parent asking for some advice on how you could uh, get your parents to not watch as much Fox News because it's damaging the relationship with the kids. And so the ones that are both parenting and politics have this feel. There's a political component to it, but there's also a parenting component to it so that it doesn't feel off in either of the groups. Uh, the Confederates posted 13 times throughout the study period. Uh, we do some analysis on to toxicity throughout this. We're using the Google API, uh, the toxicity API, in order to determine this. The reason I want to flag this is note that if anything, according to the Google toxicity API, we have a little bit more toxicity in our parenting posts compared to our politics posts. A review of this suggests some of this is because in those parenting posts, they're saying things like, you know, other kids have been mean to my kid, and the word mean, of course, flags toxicity. So that's probably accounting for some of that. Um, the, the topics that were included in both the parenting politics forum and in the politics forum include questions about sex ed, about cable TV, as you saw a moment ago, about wearing a MAGA hat to school, um, and the Harris and Trump families. 
Study attrition was a big issue. We knew it would be from the very beginning, so we tried to design our study with this in mind and also do assessment to make sure that this wasn't going to account for any of our findings. Uh, so throughout the study period, participants received reminders alerting them that you need to post this number of times, you've agreed to do so, here's what we're looking for from you. We also distributed incentives across the study period, so it wasn't just like, oh, you'll get this amount of money at the end. If they participated the amount that they agreed, they would receive an incentive partway through the study to encourage their participation throughout. Uh, we had a 32.8% completion rate of those originally recruited, which was in line what we with what we anticipated. Uh, we spent a lot of time analyzing whether the uh, attrition was differential across the conditions, which would have presented a concern for us. Um, in this instance, we don't see evidence of that. Treatment assignment does not significantly predict completing the study. Uh, we looked at interactions between the treatment assignment and pre-wave measures, and after adjustment, nothing is significant. Uh, there's also a random forest technique that we used, and uh, that also confirmed that we didn't have the presence of differential attrition in the study. Uh, here's what happens at the end. So we were, another concern might be, okay, so maybe it's not differential attrition, but maybe all of one party dropped out. So then you still have some sort of problem you're claiming here that you're having cross-partisan interaction. Uh, we don't see evidence that that occurred. If we look at the mix of Democrats and Republicans by condition, there are no significant differences here. So we had both Democrats and Republicans remain in the study throughout the study period. Um, when we looked at do people have the impression of what was discussed, do we see evidence that people in the parenting group got it was about parenting? And very critically, do we see people in the parent political condition report that something political happened there? Like, do they recognize the setup that we had there? And we find evidence that that's the case. So those in the parent and the parent political condition um, report that parenting came up really often. Those in the political condition report that it comes off up once in a while, which all of these were parents, so not, not surprising there. Uh, when we look at the government and politics one, this is kind of a critical check to make sure that people understood what happened and we find evidence exactly in line with this. Obviously, those in the political group believe that politics came up a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, those people in the parent political group see a little bit of politics that happened in those spaces and those people in the parenting groups uh, significantly less than that. So this kind of checks out in terms of a manipulation check that people were aware of what happened. Uh, we also looked at the percentage of political posts, so not people's impressions, the posts themselves. We coded all of the posts to identify whether they were political or non-political. We also looked at a bunch of other things. We'll talk about some of them here. Um, and this also bears out with that, that we see in the political ones, and these don't include, by the way, the Confederates, um, because that would, necess not would necessar necessarily look like this. So without the Confederates, we find that the political groups have a lot more political posts, the parent groups have almost none, and then the parent political groups have just a little bit. So all of this lines up. Uh, we also asked people, what percentage of others in your group do you think shared your views? Because even though we have equal number of Democrats and Republicans, what could have happened is that uh, some groups uh, due to attrition ended up with all Democrats, and some groups through attrition ended up as all Republicans. Uh, we don't have evidence that that occurred. I'm just sharing their own, um, their own personal perspectives here, but can share more detail on that, that we don't have evidence of that from the posts either. Um, and in general, people say, you know, 50%, between 41 and 60% of people share my views in these groups. So they recognize that there's uh, conflicting views. Um, and I should mention also that we made sure within each of these groups that 50% of them were Democrats and 50% were Republicans. So each group was purposefully constructed uh, to come up with cross-partisan uh, contexts. Okay, so uh, the way we did the analysis, we used mixed level, uh, mixed effects models uh, with robust standard errors. Variables are standardized, we cluster on the groups. Um, participants are only included, they completed the first and second survey, and we included controls, although substantively they actually don't make any difference at all. Oops. Um, the dependent variables of interest here are first the substance of the post, so how many words per comment? Do we see changes there in terms of what people are posting? We look at the toxicity of posts using the perspective API, and then we analyze people's impressions of the subreddit and their impressions of the opposite political party. And what we find, uh, so first we're looking at the number of words per comment. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do this analysis, uh, so we're just showing you a couple of them here. So the first is you could just look at all the comments that were included in the subreddit. The second is you could aggregate that, aggregate that by person, so you're looking at average words by person. And another way you could do it is only look at those people that completed the full study. So we have all comments, we have those aggregated by person, and then we have those aggregated by person that actually completed the study. 
And you can see here the, um, the withheld group is those people in the parenting conversations. And it seems like there's a slight reduction in comment length in the political community, but probably nothing here to really write home about. So not tons that we're finding here in terms of the length of comments that people leave. Uh, in terms of toxicity, it's pretty clear here that the political community um, has more toxic posts. And this is measured by the Google um, API. Um, so this reflects some other research that's been done looking at the toxicity of politics versus other topics. So this coheres with past research as well. And so what we find is that there's more toxicity in the political communities uh, compared to the parenting communities relatively consistently. The only place we don't see it significantly is when we only look at those that completed the post survey as well. The, uh, the direction of the effect is in the same. The standard errors just get a little bit bigger as so we're reducing that. Then we looked at what people thought about these communities. So what was their impression of what happened in the space? We asked two questions that related to this, asking them about the subreddit experience and the conversation tone. Um, we did an EFA and there appeared to be two of the two uh, factors that filter out from this. Uh, the first is people's impressions of the tone. So was it civil and respectful and courteous? And the second was their impressions of the subreddit itself. And so these are, these are things like, I would like to continue in this subreddit after the study ends. Um, in this study, we in fact, even after the study ended, had a few people that wrote in to their subreddits after the study was done saying, do you guys want to continue this a little longer? So uh, we know that some people were really enjoying this experience. And this is just really tapping into what people thought about that and how much they enjoyed it and wanted to continue. Okay, so for these, I'm, I'll show you, this is just the raw means, and then I'll show you the um, statistical analyses here. Uh, but in general, we do see differences across groups instead of in terms of what they thought about it and in terms of what they thought the tone was. And in general, what we see is that for both parent political and political, their um, impression of the subreddit was more negative than parenting alone. And what's really noteworthy about this, I think, is that parent political, especially in terms of attitudes, is in fact no different from political. So interjecting even a little bit of politics into that parenting space was enough to make people say, oh, I'm not, this isn't so great. I don't want to be part of this space any longer. And in terms of tone, uh, those people in the political spaces were particularly sensitive to tone. So uh, they're significantly, uh, they believe the tone is more negative if they were in a political space compared to those in the parent political group. Um, I'll just offer one aside. Uh, we've received some questions on this about whether or not there are differences by partisanship. In general, we don't see any with one exception and it has to do with tone. And if we look at tone by party, um, Democrats are particularly sensitive to the tone in the political, um, in the political subreddits. It's, it's still statistically significant in the anticipated direction for both Democrats and Republicans, um, but Democrats are a little bit more sensitive to the tone in the political conversation, which I find kind of an interesting aside. Okay, the next thing we did is we had a whole battery of different questions because we wanted to find out, is there any evidence here that when you're in a parent political group, you develop some form of tolerance for those who don't share your views? And so we asked questions. Um, all, these are all pulled from past research looking at um, intergroup contact and polarization and all sorts of literatures like that. So we looked at perceptions of threat, of prejudice, polarization, anxiety, and out-party traits, as you see here. Um, and the story here is a whole bunch of null results. So we actually see no evidence that participating in any of these um, chats, no matter if it was parenting political, political, uh, or parenting just in general, it didn't have any influence in terms of people's outgroup attitudes. Uh, the next thing that we've been doing is actually looking at what's happening on Reddit in parent political groups. So we're getting outside of the artificial context of our experiment to understand what's happening in the real world context uh, of parenting subgroups on Reddit. And so to do this, um, we first trained a classifier and we ran, to do this, we randomly sampled 100,000 posts from political communities and 100,000 posts from non-political communities. And then we trained a classifier to detect the political posts. Um, we did this using a human in the loop um, uh, technique uh, because when we were doing this, what we realized is that we're, we're not too, too bad, as you'll see with the stats here in just a minute, uh, we're not too, too bad at finding the cases that are not political. 
But in finding cases that are political, it turns out to be a little bit trickier. So we used the classifier first to identify potential posts that were political, and then we had a team go in and code whether or not those posts were actually political. And so when we did that, we end up with a false negative rate of 4.7%, so not terrible in terms of a false negative rate. Um, but the false positive rate, I think, is the one to really pay attention to and gives, I think, the reason for why we need to do this. So we had a 62.5% false negative rate or excuse me, false positive rate. And so in the end, what we end up with um, based on the classifier paired with the human in the loop is out of the 62,000 posts that we gathered from parenting uh, subreddits uh, in 2021, 502 uh, were identified as political. So a huge difference in terms of how many were actually political. Uh, compared to what the classifier detected. And so what we wanted to look at is how are people engaging with these political posts on Reddit uh, when, they're, when they're encountering them in this parenting sub, subreddit context. <coughs> and so we, what we find is that actually politics, when it happens in these non-political spaces, actually increases engagement. So when people in a parenting subreddit come across a political post, it actually yields more comments in response to that post compared to the non-political posts. So politics is interjected in there, gets more comments in response to it compared to those non-political posts. We also looked at the number of unique users and it actually gets more unique users compared to the average non-political posts in these parenting subreddits. So I think there's a lot of interesting uh, things to think about that come from this sort of research. When we ask the question, what are the effects of incidentally encountering partisan content in non-political spaces, I think that the conclusion we're seeing here is that political content encountered incidentally isn't necessarily helpful. And I think this is actually a substantively important finding. I've been to so many different workshops and collaborations where we get together and say, how are we going to change things? How are we going to bring people together? And inevitably, in those contexts, it's let's bring people together in some context other than politics, and then we'll bring politics up halfway through. And I think we have to have these sorts of studies to say, like, does that work? Well, at least in this particular instance, I don't think we, we see evidence of it. Uh, first, what we find is that can it can increase engagement, right? So more people are contributing to it. More unique users are contributing to it. So when you get uh, political content in non-political spaces, it actually increases and boosts engagement and attention to it, which is pretty wild that that's happening. Um, but at the same time, it, people don't like it. It depresses their attitudes about the forum. We saw subreddit attitudes go down when even a little bit of politics was introduced there, and it increased impressions of the negative tone. So even a little politics made people say, oh my gosh, this is just negative overall. The interesting part is when we looked at the actual levels of toxicity, if you'll recall, the toxicity was higher empirically using Google's um, API in the politics group, but empirically it actually wasn't higher in the parenting politics group. So people believe it to be more toxic, even though based on at least the measure of Google's toxicity API, it actually was not more toxic in those parenting political forums. So the perception of toxicity seems to be raised in people's minds just by encountering politics, irrespective of whether it actually is toxic using measures like the toxicity API. And then the final one um, is that there actually is no discernible effect on out-party perceptions, that at least for this study where people were in these chats for three weeks, uh, we didn't see any, any difference there. So I think there are a number of implications from this. Um, first, I think cross-cutting and intergroup contacts show no evidence of positively influencing social media users' polarization or impressions of those from the other party. Um, we see that political talk depressed attitudes even when the users were interested in talking about politics and expected it. Uh, so you see that in the politics groups. Uh, we also did some work where we were looking at what if we only look at those people who were interested in politics to begin with, and the same thing appears there too. So there seems to be something just off-putting about politics entering into these non-political spaces. And then perceptions of toxicity of the group were larger than measuring toxicity using the Google um, API. So uh, I'm right at my 30 minutes, so thank you so much and really, really excited to hear your thoughts and questions on this. Wonderful. I think you sit here. Okay. Right, yeah. Well, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you.
I'm totally persuaded, by the way. So I'm in a, <laughs> I'm in a, I'm in a, a strange position here. But let, let me start with the kind of meta question about what we think this means about um, either social media or, or how we should, what interventions might address polarization. So one takeaway could be that what we need to do is just um, talk about politics less, right? And have, and, and that the more we accentuate people's non-political identities, the more that that might have knock-on effects for depolarization, right? So the problem is that um, once things get political, then it's sort of irredeemable, right? There's nothing, once we start talking about the politics, then, um, then it's inevitably gonna be polarized because it's not like the more you know someone, the more you love them, right? The more you know someone, the more you might hate them, right? Is that right or wrong? What do you think? Yeah, so I have two minds of that. The first is that if we never have politics come up, I don't think we can anticipate that it would have any beneficial effects. Because uh, the research in intergroup context suggests that if you don't even know that person is from another group, then it doesn't influence your perception of that other group at all. So at best, that would be a neutral phenomenon. Um, on the other hand, I think that maybe it's worth thinking about the way in which people talk about politics online. So we based our stimuli on a qualitative review of how people were doing it naturally. And I think if anything, we erred on the side of being less toxic than what people uh, do in reality. But I think that there is some promise in terms of how do we encourage people to talk about politics? Are there different ways that they could approach it that might encourage people to be mm -hmm. more open to different views? And maybe this shouldn't happen in non-political spaces. That might not be the right forum. I still hold out hope, though, that there's some mechanism that we can use that would be beneficial for reducing polarization. But, well, let, but let's build on that last yeah. point. So, so if you've got... Um, it, it, say in, in, in the other area I work in, in the, in the like election context, when we think about the perceptions of election fraud, we talk about saints, sinners, and salvageables, right? So there are people who are just irredeemable, you yeah. know, that you, there's no way you're going to, to push them off of a particular position. There are those who are, uh, you know, I don't want to say just open-minded, but, but are, are th those who are, who, who believe in, say, the integrity of the system, and then those who are persuadable. So, I guess part of my question is like about the heterogeneity of these groups. To what extent would we expect certain types of people to react in the negative way that you suggest here, as opposed to everybody either opting out or or becoming more um, hostile? Right. I mean, you must have a theory about the type. Is it? Um, you know, it, it's not as if everybody in these parenting groups is then going to feel this way about the outgroup as a result of the injection of politics, right? It's a certain subset. Do you have any sort of theories as about sort of who that is? Is it is it the people who come in with the most ardent political positions to begin with, which might be likely or? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that people who are more sensitive to politics and have uh, have strong partisan predispositions to begin with are going to be those that are less less persuadable in the sense that they're willing to say the other side is okay. Yeah. So we have some people here who have either worked at social media companies or may currently, and, and many people online who, who have. Um, and I want, I want people to, to jump in with their own questions. Um, but, but suppose people at Facebook, Twitter, and Google are reading this paper. Um, how should they, does this give them any guide as to what interventions they should do uh, or, or just those that they should avoid? Yeah, I mean, I think that it suggests one reason that groups decompose, right? Is that when you have these groups in non-political spaces, they can become incredibly fractious and you can see people just filter off as soon as politics is interjected in those spaces. Uh, so I think that it gives a reason that if the purpose of some parts of social media is to bring people together, that this is a way that actually uh, harms that and makes it difficult for people to find common ground. So uh, it might be a matter of talking to moderators who are trying to create really cohesive spaces and saying, hey, moderators, you know, once politics comes up, you need to be thoughtful from the beginning of this. What sort of policy do you have in mind as a moderator for your knitting group online? Do you even have one? Or are you just gonna let politics run wild as soon as that comes up for the first time? And uh, 
I think that the Ravelry, the knitting group that I mentioned uh, at the outset, I think they would have probably benefited in hindsight from saying, what policies do we have in place for our group itself as soon as politics come up? Because if you want to create a space where people with very different political views are still coming together, then I think this suggests that once politics comes up, you need to have a, a system for filtering that out relatively quickly before it just catches like wildfire and causes the decomposition in many ways of that group. Do you think though that online interaction is more likely to lead to this phenomenon than interpersonal, you know, real life interaction. We have a whole group here, you know, on deliberative polling, which kind of goes, they're, they're, I'd say, going against this view, right? It's like, yeah. oh, if only we had people and lock them in a room for a day with uh, Stanford professors, oh, <laughs> wouldn't this be a much better day but, but world, right? And so uh, what, what, what do you... What do you think about that? Is, is it something also about the way that people interact online that, that would make it more polarizing? I mean, I think there's a lot that yeah. rides on that, right? I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people certainly believe that social media or at least in digital communication technologies are inherently polarizing for one reason or another. Yeah, I don't know that I'd in agree that they're inherently polarizing, but I do think there's a difference between being face-to-face -face and being online. I think the trick is that face-to-face -face can reach, you know, 100 people, maybe where online, this can reach lots and lots of people. So I think there's a scale question of how can we take some of the benefits of things that we see in these interpersonal settings and see if there are ways to bring those online. Well, I guess what I, I'm trying to pick at like particular, mm -hmm. we use the word affordances too much, I think, okay. but, but, but the, 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 the way that people interact in digital spaces. Yeah. So since you were saying that people had Reddit handles here, they were anonymous to each other? Correct. Okay. Yes, this so, was done so that's in the just Reddit an example of, you know, one thing you might think they're more likely to engage in polarizing and toxic uh, conversation when they don't face the consequences personally. Uh, and so that might be, you know, one way to think about how, uh, you know, if you were going to intervene to try to depolarize these spaces, there may be certain interventions that you would, as well as, mm -hmm. as well as like if you had the Google toxicity API, you know, flag things and like what Twitter did. Do you really want to send this? Um, yeah. This terrible message to your friends, right, right, or, right. or to the public? Yeah. yeah, I think there are a number of affordances to use the term that might uh, change these dynamics. But uh, you know, even in uh, non-anonymous settings, people say really horrible things. Um, and I think that the idea of intergroup contact theory is that if people form common bonds, that, that, that they should be less likely to do all of that because they have this affinity for one another and an affinity for a particular topic. And, you know, we tried to create that in this, and there's some evidence that we did, given that the parenting groups evaluated it so much more positively. And I think that the, the result of this suggests that that it, it, it isn't, that there's something about bonding that can really be dissolved quickly. And I, I suspect that some of that uh, is going to be agnostic to affordances. So I think it's worth thinking about how much of this effect can be amplified or diminished on the basis of the mix of affordances. Great. Well, so we've got lots of questions that are coming in online, but I want to let me start in the room first, right over here. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned that one better intervention might be to change the way we talk about politics. So I'm wondering if you uh, went down assessing topics or posts and how they unfolded and assessed like how how people perceive the toxicity of specific conversations and maybe have insight on why those conversations that were probably perceived to be less toxic were perceived that way. Like what did the moderator do or what did certain uh, Reddit users say to make the conversation less toxic? Yeah, so in the context of this study, when we look at the actual um, way in which the chats happened and what happened there, we did do a lot of analysis looking at what happened in, because we had the exact same post in the politics chat as in the parenting politics one. And there's really no big difference between those two. So those are very similar in terms of how they unfold. And people, uh, they're not more toxic in one compared to the other. We have no evidence of that. Uh, if you read through the actual transcripts and see what people are saying, it, you definitely have some where they're, uh, they're shifting from a parenting mode in some ways to a politics mode. Um, there's one, this is just one example out of all the groups, so I hesitate to even mention it. But we did have one person say, what's happening here? Are you trying to troll us? And we had gone through a lot of um, debrief trying to find out, like, did people get it? Did they have suspicions? And that's the only evidence that we have from the whole study that anyone 
and I don't even know if it was a suspicion that something weird was happening or if they were reacting to that. So there was one example of that in the study. Outside of this study, though, we've been doing some research trying to figure out what sort of ways can you communicate that might leave people more open to a different point of view. Um, and we've been focusing on the idea of humility and how that's contained within language. And so we've done some evaluation of what if you show people um, posts that are rank higher on humility compared to those that don't. And the way that we've been doing that is we keep them substantively comparable. So the actual content of the post is the same. We just add things like, um, in my opinion, or I could be wrong, or things like that. Um, and people recognize that they are much more receptive and they are more, um, they're, they're just more courteous to the person that's making those comments. They would rather get together with that person. They'd rather work with that person on something, even though it was expressing a counter attitudinal perspective. So I think that there are some components to language that help. Now, whether we have a, you know, humility detector that's saying or that's revising people's language to be more humble. Um, oh, the other thing I should mention is with that, there were no differences by party. So both Democrats and Republicans had similar positive reactions to that sort of language. So I think there's some hope there, but in the study, we don't see a lot of that. I don't think people naturally talk that way as frequently as we might wish. Could you talk a little bit about the most political things that happen in these groups? So, mm -hmm. so there's the Fox <laughs> News example, which I took as like, uh, yeah, I could see what direction that was going in. But did someone say, yeah. jump in and say, hey, we should all vote for Trump or something like that? Or I mean, what would be, because I think there's, there's, there's political and there's political, right? It's, it's, yeah. And so, and, and yeah. I'm, I'm really intrigued by the hand coding that the, when, yes. people, when, when humans went in and looked at it, they knocked out whatever, two thirds of the things that, that the uh, algorithm flagged as political yeah. and found that that was not political. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of wondering whether the humans are right here. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's that's a lot. I mean, I'm sure they are, but 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 it's judgment calls as to how you know how political does something need to be before it's political? Because parenting yeah. is political, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, it's it's yes. like as just go on next door. You know, you'll you'll see <laughs> what, what what it's like, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a really good question, and it kind of filters through both components of this, both the computational and the experimental study, in a couple of different ways. So, in the experiment itself, uh, when people introduce themselves in the political groups. Our Confederates did not reveal their partisanship in the first introduction. They would just say things like, looking forward to this group or something like that. Uh, but a non-trivial percentage of people that entered those groups reveal their partisanship right from the introduction. So they were like, I am a you know, proud Republican, eager to chat with you all. So in the political context, that came out right away. And we only picked people for the study that identified as Democrats or Republicans. So people that were in the middle weren't even included. And it became very clear very quickly in those political chats that it was diverse, right? Because we purposefully put half and half Democrats and Republicans. In the posts that were in both the parenting political and the political group, I would say that they, they indicated partisanship, um, but they weren't they weren't, it was things like the example that we shared with the grandparents are watching Fox News, we don't approve of that. There was another one, my kid got in trouble for wearing a MAGA hat to school, what do you think about that? So it's subtly indicating partisanship in parenting. Uh, it, it, it resembled posts that we had seen in those sorts of groups, um, but it's a little bit lighter. And then in terms of the computational work, when we're looking at what's political, um, we have an immense code book that I'm happy to share if anyone is interested in that. And I agree, right? We came with a particular definition of what counted as political, but if we asked people, is this political or not, I'm certain we would end up with some percentage of those having diverse views. I think that we erred on the side of being pretty strict in terms of what political is because we wanted to know for those political sorts of topics, do we see a difference in terms of how people are engaging with them? And if we err a little bit on the side of saying that some that maybe have a political tinge aren't, we're actually being more conservative in our, in our findings. So for that, I think we were, uh, we were purposefully a little bit more strict. Great. Sahar? <laughs> Can you hear me? I assume so. Hi, I'm Sahar. Uh, I'm in town because of the uh, Trust and Social Cohesion Conference which is about oh, bringing great. peace builders and tech yes. people together. And I'm trying to like link what I heard there with what I'm hearing here. Yeah. Also, I'm from the Integrity Institute. Uh, so I'm trying to wrap my head around the implications of what you said. And uh, <laughs> one thing that I'm hearing 
is the sense of, wow, only a little bit of politics kind of like hurts this group in a, in a more major way than you would expect. Um, another way that I could see it though is, wow, this group was so nascent and so like underdeveloped in their group identity that you know, bringing the sledgehammer of the main, you know, divide in society, of course broke it apart because it was so weak. Um, mm -hmm. And A, I wonder what you think of that. Mm -hmm. uh, B, I'm trying to think about the implicate, like to per Nate's uh, suggestion, like the implications for practitioners. And I just, you know, I, I just come back to this idea of this was a group of people explicitly trying to create a group identity uh, with each other and not trying to like, have a feed, you know, with, with anonymous people. And so trying to think about what this means, I'm just much more drawn towards the peace builder sort of conversations that we had at that conference uh, than sort of like theory of ranking conversations because that does feel like a unique uh, sort of experience. I'm more to say, but that's probably my time. That's probably enough points. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Uh, love that. And yes, um, I have been chatting with the focus of that conference and was disappointed not to be there, but my colleague Deepti Doshi from um, New Public was able to join, so I hope you got a chance to chat with her. Um, so uh, the, the first part of the question I think has to do with the length of the study, if I'm boiling it down, right? We only did this for three weeks. We actually had a lot of conversation at the beginning in terms of like how long should this be and you have to weigh the demands of the experiment and whether or not you're going to retain people through that also with trying to create bonds. Um, we ended up settling on three weeks trying to balance those two but of course like can I say that the same thing would happen if they had chatted with each other for a year and then politics came up afterward. I can't. I can't say that about this. I will say that the anecdotal evidence of things that happened on Ravelry, for example, uh, suggests that this can tear apart even groups that have been really well established, which that one was. So I don't think that we're totally off in calling that. And the other reason that I don't think we're totally off is that people in the parenting groups, they did experience some sort of bonding, like they were you can see it empirically in what they said about the group and their willingness to continue on with it. It wasn't like a five out of one to five. We never get that. But there definitely were things going on. And I think my other anecdote of people like, hey, who wants to keep chatting afterward? So I, 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 I guess I, I grant your point in some ways, but I also see evidence that I'm not sure that this isn't, uh, that this isn't something that we have to be worried about even for groups that are more established. Um, and then the second part of yours, thinking about peace building and ranking conversations and things like that, I'm, I think I'm, I'm fully on board with that sort of perspective that um, are there ways that you could architect environments that try to promote better understanding? I don't know that the mix of affordances will allow you to say like, here's the perfect environment for politics to come up about this part through and then it'll be okay. Um, but I think and I'll, I'll say I'm, I'm not an expert in the peace keeping and peace building um, literature, but I think that there's some components of like the, the architecture under which things come up. And it's, I don't think that non-political spaces like this are the ideal spot for that to happen, if that makes sense. One question we got uh, from Ashwin Rao on, uh, online and, and, and folks can continue submitting some of these, is to what degree do you think the uh, antipathy to politics is because it was irrelevant to the parenting group as opposed to it being about politics? So that um, Ashwin asks, uh, you know, suppose that people started talking about cars in the parenting yeah. group, would yeah. it have also alienated people? It's like, well, I'm not here for this. So what do you think? Yeah, it, it could be. So it could be that people are like, hey, that's not the point of this chat to begin with. Why is this happening here? I will say that the posts that we architected did have a parenting component to them. So it wasn't like a, just a random topic in there. Mm -hmm. It was like, here's, it was politics infused with parenting, which is why these were posts both in the politics groups and in the parenting politics groups. So I suspect that people didn't have quite the aversive reaction that they would have if someone came in and was like, hey, I love my car, that had no connection to um, parenting whatsoever. But I think there might be a, a kind of deeper part to, I think, Ashwin's question here, which is, like, is this, are non-political spaces in people's minds supposed to be about non-political topics? And anytime you veer off of that, even if, even if it's 
kind of related? Is it just off-putting for people? And that might be part of it. That might be part of the explanation for why this is not really the greatest strategy for encouraging cross-partisan deep connection. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we have some questions, uh, Ernie Rosado asks, about whether you saw differences on the basis of gender or race in people's, um, uh, well, I guess, reaction to the introduction, or, or just in general in your models. Yeah, it's a great question. We did, um, we did include controls for all sorts of demographic, fa demographic factors in here, but I didn't look specifically at interactions with gender um, or race. Um, in the other study that I mentioned earlier where we were looking at humility and whether people are using um, humility in their speech when talking about political um, topics, there we didn't find many interactions with other demographic or uh -huh. partisan variables. Uh, so maybe that would be the case here. We, we have 323 people, so it's not as though we have like a huge sample size to make some of those assessments. Um, How? What was the gender split, say, of those 323? Is uh, it I don't remember off the top of my head, but we tried even? to get it relatively balanced. Okay. I don't remember off the top no, of my head. No, because I could mm -hmm. imagine that there might be different um, interactions between mothers' groups and fathers' groups. Or could be. This like was that. definitely gender mixed, so it wasn't just women. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, Samit over here. Hi, uh, fascinating study. I actually had a follow-up to Nate's previous question about how the Confederates had very overtly political uh, topics that they brought up. How do you think the study results might be different if they were more policy-oriented rather than politically-oriented? So posting about uh, the high health care insurance bill I got for my kid or something like that. How, how do you expect this might be different? Yeah, I, perhaps it wouldn't have cued that. I think, though, that as we see more and more topics and the way people write about them cue partisanship and politics, which is a trend that we see across all sorts of evidence, I think that the zone of political topics that you can talk about that don't bring about partisan identity has narrowed over the course of the past decade or so. So there probably is a zone where that could be okay, but I expect it to be exceedingly small and rarer as time passes. Can you remind me what the period was when you, you did this? Was it like during an yeah. election season or anything? No, or, no, or was it, when this was wasn't it? during an election. It was, um, we did the first one in uh, June of 2021, and the second one I think was starting in October. Because so I was, was outside of the election like context. COVID, it, uh, apropos this, you could see all kinds of COVID-related topics that would come into a parenting discussion, you know, say with COVID in schools, masks, uh, school closures, things like that. Which I assume would be would those, those be would be coded as political? Do you think? By yeah, your... if they had any political implication to them, so we coded things as political. If they would say something like, um, uh, "I don't think we should be wearing masks. Masks are useless," or things that had a tinge that of would it, be. we coded yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and yeah. part of the challenge here is that so much of our life is is becoming political. I mean, to, yeah. I, I, one of the reasons I'm I'm totally convinced of, about this is my experience with sports. Uh, and, and, and that, no, I mean, that, that, that you know, and particularly with racial politics and, and, and sports, right, where, where, you know, that sports teams have, be, there's, there's studies on this as well as uh, my own experience and, you know, being part of a team where politics is not necessarily the, um, you know, guiding force and then how uh, intergroup interactions in those environments ends up having knock-on effects elsewhere, but it's not... It's not that we in inject politics. And now the problem now is that sports has become politicized. So yeah. something like, you know, Colin Kaepernick, I saw it now has a, a Nike ad, right? And then Fox News writes about that, right? And, or, or broadcasts about it. And then obviously the president says he should be fired or something like that. And it's, it's all our pre previous president. Uh, so everything has become political. Yes, right here. Thank you so much for your talk. I have um, two short questions. One is um, regarding your finding that political content increased engagement. Do you think this would also hold true long term? Because I could see how maybe in short term people are very interested in discussing it, but longer term they might leave the platform and decide to disengage. And the second one is, did you find any heterogeneous treatment effects, for example, for more versus less active users? Okay. Um, writing them down so I don't forget. Uh, okay, so heterogeneous effects with less or uh, more active users, and your first one, one more time. Um, is the like more okay, over time. Yeah. Okay, so the first one, um, do I think that, that would happen over time? 
I think that if the dynamics of a group started to shift to totally over to politics, probably that would change lots of things. And if our results from the study generalized, which to the extent that they do, um, people didn't enjoy the experience as much as soon as politics came up. So their intentions to stay with the group afterward and their feeling of being bonded went down. So that would suggest that more of them would leave. So that if, that, if a group that was dedicated to parenting went to politics and then shifted that way, that would be my anticipated consequence. And I think that coheres with um, several other projects like the um, work out of Wisconsin by Wells and others that suggest that people just opt out at some moment. We see evidence of that as well. And then it, are there any heterogeneous effects with active users? Uh, we um, filtered out non-active users at the very beginning of this. So people had to have been on, they had to have a Reddit account, they had to have been on at relatively frequency. It wasn't like a huge frequency, but I think we said that they had to have been on um, for six, they had to have been on multiple times over the past six months or something like that, then they were included in the study. So these weren't like the occasional users. And then as a requirement to be in the study, they were required to post a certain number of times. So I think for those reasons, I really, we don't have, we, I didn't look at um, particularly heterogeneous effects for uh, frequency of use. Yeah. See, I can now see Jen Pan in the back. I didn't, <laughs> I, 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 she was blocked before, but there yeah. you are. Um, uh, just the main takeaway, one of the main takeaways from this is that people are turned off by politics. It engages people, but people don't like it. So if we had a co-partisan group that was mostly parenting, and then politics was interjected, would we expect the same results? I think maybe. And so if we think that maybe a co-partisan group would have the same results, then we're expecting a lot of the cross-partisan group to have some sort of different outcome. Um, instead, and I don't know if you looked at this, another measure is not necessarily, uh, is something more narrow, which is are they willing to continue with this group? Is there a significant difference between the parenting only and the parenting with politics? Because if there is not, then that's actually something optimistic, that despite their negative experience with that interjection of politics, they're still willing to be connected. But I don't know if you're well-powered enough to, to measure that. Yeah, so that was one of the measures included in the subreddit attitudes measure, was we asked people if they would be willing to continue in the group, and there is a significant difference where those in parenting politics are less likely to want to continue compared to those in politics. Again, it's aggregated up with the others, but it's a high reliability measure. Uh, uh, but if you separate it out, it is significant. Uh, I don't recall if we've done that, but the alpha, the reliability on it is like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, so okay. I would anticipate that uh, that would be the case on that one. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think we have that positive conclusion. Okay. And then on the former point, would this happen in groups that share partisanship? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. And it would be um, interesting to find out because I could see a scenario in which um, it would be, uh, it, I could see a scenario in which it might be off putting in that context as well. But I think the thing that's really important to study about these moments where people from different groups come together is that doesn't happen that often. And so this is one space where we've seen people from different groups come together. And intergroup contact theory suggests that this, the way that this transpires should be this ideal for people to, to have sympathies toward that other group. If anything, I would expect if that happened in a, in a co-partisan setting, I would expect that it would intensify their distaste for the other side. So I would not have the same uh, theoretical uh, outcome that I would anticipate from that context. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, Obviously, you're trying to study co-partisan interactions, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so it's not relevant to study, I'm sorry, cross-partisans is not relevant to study co-partisan, but if we do think that even for co-partisans, encountering politics is going to lead to a negative outcome, then it's putting a lot on cross-partisan interactions. So I think it's the overall conclusion is the same, that it's not a it's really difficult problem to overcome, um, but, but it, yeah. So. Yeah. I uh, totally agree, and I think that that's really fair for like the engagement part and for people's impressions. Um, I think that the attitudinal aspect of what do you think of out partisans, though, may be different across co and cross partisan groups. But uh, point well taken in terms of the way people feel like this is very off putting. I am in a parenting group. I don't want to hear about politics right now. Right. So, uh, and this sort of final. Point, let me just to clarify this, which is that there are some people who are in parenting groups who never want to talk about politics, and so therefore they're going to uh, 
abscond, and then you've got people who don't want conflict, right, with, uh, uh, with their priors, right? And so if you had a Democratic parenting group, even if you didn't call it that, and then a Republican comes in and says these things, that then that would be the thing that would motivate them. Yeah, and the I question is, what, like, what, what's most likely to happen in the wild? And it's sort of, well, it depends. It depends what, what context we're seeing these groups in. Yeah, and in the wild and parenting groups, I mean, what we do see is that it seems to attract people that it attracts more people, it attracts more comments. So in the wild, when politics does come up, it gets people to look at it. And based on the experimental data, uh, maybe not the same people, but for other people, they do exactly what you're saying, which is, Great. I'm out of here. Well, thank you so much. We've run out of time. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Stroud. Thank you. Next, next week, we've got Claire Wardle, who'll be talking about sort of rethinking uh, the definition of misinformation. So please come back and join us for that.